welcome all of you. It's a source of pride uh, to see the city opening up again uh, and become a hub for thought, for discussion, uh, for the rest of Pakistan and the world to come and um, uh, be based in and come and engage in. This has always been a crossroads. Um, and uh, it's been through a 15-year period that has been painful and challenging. Uh, but I think that we should all be proud of the fact that we're actually emerging out of that period and emerging more vibrant to take our place in the world again. The um, reason that I'm here actually is because it just really excites me. Uh, and I think that uh, as representatives, we need to play that role to actually give the message that's back here. Right? We do believe that Pukhtunkhwa is a gateway to economic prosperity in Pakistan. Uh, and I'll tell you how. Right? I want to focus on two or three sides to that story. Uh, I think first of all, and you'll have heard this in discussions, the economic potential of Pukhtunkhwa, uh, and in particular in terms of uh, increasing uh, Pakistan's uh, trade, Pakistan's uh, economic dynamism, right, is significant for not just one reason, but two or three. First, because it was a market that has been through a relatively challenging period. There's that growth potential. We all, uh, as far as Pakistan is concerned, talk of Karachi and Lahore and Islamabad and think that those are the big markets. But if you think of uh, Pukhtunkhwa as a whole, with the merger of Fata, it's about 35 million people, up to 40 million people. And 40 million people is about the size of a large European country. There's probably only five or six European countries that are larger in size than 40 million. So this is a big market, and it's a big market that's dynamic, that's young. Um, we've been uh, certainly... Um, uh, quite dynamic at uh, keeping a pretty high population growth rate. But so we need to try and now take the dividend of that. Uh, we do have a large segment of youth in our society that I keep on selling as saying, because the private sector is underrepresented over here. You have more raw youth with more potential that's more hungry and eager for success than perhaps some of the other more developed urban centers of the country uh, where uh, there are more options, more opportunities. So that's one reason why this is a potential gateway for growth within the country, because it's a market whose potential has been untapped. And I want everyone who is from outside Pukhtunwa to actually take that message. What also builds on that is the fact that there's a government that has come in for the second time. And I won't talk to you just from a party perspective. I'll explain this to you rationally. Because accountants should be rational people. And businessmen should be rational people and take rational decisions. The challenge here was the fact that we, to do this, had to involve seven or eight different entities across the federal and provincial government. So the provincial government, the DC office, the FC, NLC, which operates the border terminal, um, the military, which is a, a, a relevant stakeholder in the tribal districts in terms of security, uh, FIA, uh, customs, NADRA, and the foreign office. Now, it's very simple. All you have to do is to keep the gates open, but to get this done, the difficult part in Pakistan uh, to do initiatives like this is actually to put eight or nine people around the table that represent different entities and do it. We took the decision to do this in January. We went to the federal government, to the PM's office, to request help. The PM championed it. 
uh, tasked his uh, advisor on establishment at Bab Shahzad, who helped co-lead it from the federal government. We agreed to do this in January last year and set ourselves a target of six months. I remember our first meeting was on the 30th of January and on the 3rd of September, six months and three days later. So we were three days late. Um, we actually opened the border 24-7. And you know the impact because we try and look at the figures and I was a, a consultant in my past life. So that's like a poor version of an accountant because we try to be decent with numbers but we're not as precise as you are. But we opened the border and in the last three months looking at growth versus the previous four months, both Tax revenue as well as exports have increased by over 80%. And if we look at year-on-year -year growth, then exports have increased by about 25%. And import taxes have increased manifold. So the issue here was to spend a little bit of money to get this right. And because the federal government was facing complications in terms of figuring out how to do this, we actually stepped out of the box and didn't lend but donated money to the federal government to open the Torkham border, basically to put lighting, generators, etc. We spent 70 million of the province's money to do this. The impact annualized based on current data of that 70 million rupees that we spent is 4.4 billion rupees in additional tax revenue for the country. And the minimum of $200 million, so 32 billion rupees a year, in terms of additional exports. This is still with very rudimentary facilities. But what makes me proud and what should make you take notice is the fact that this was something where the provincial government championed an initiative which was not even its own core mandate. But that's how the Portunhua government is thinking progressively and is literally opening the gates to greater economic prosperity in Pakistan through greater trade, greater exports, greater local economic activity, and greater revenue for the entire country. Right? This is just one example of that sort of thinking. So today the meeting that we had was on how to increase, uh, how to get further impact because literally this is only happening with a very limited setup, with very limited investment. We want to make the passenger crossing experience more pleasant. We want to increase the throughput of trade by improving process flows, increasing staff. Because I promise you if we spend another 100 million rupees on it, you'll probably double the impact. Because you still have a setup which only works about 70 to 75% of the time. And that is the sort of win-wins that we ought to be looking for. Right? That's obviously not our, our only big economic step. The, the, perhaps, um, and Hassan Daoud, our new board of investment head, was here on stage and he's played a fantastic role along with the folks at uh, KPSMEC. I don't know if anyone is here, but... Um, in terms of signing what is Pakistan's most unique agreement in terms of a special economic zone where we are actually using the capabilities of international partners, in this case renowned Chinese state companies, to JV with us on what should be Pakistan's most dynamic special economic zone that opens up significant export opportunities both to China, but also through this same Torkham border that we've pushed to open to Afghanistan and Central Asia. We are, of course, also making big investments across the energy sector. Uh, we are making big investments, hopefully down the line, in the mines and mineral sector. Uh, we are going to be the fulcrum of Pakistan's tourism industry, uh, and we need to work further because we believe in doing this in a focused manner 
on other industries such as housing where there's also significant potential because of the shortage of housing units, right? But so just think as this market opens up for 45 million people, with the merger of the former tribal districts, the opportunity for economic activity in this province, even in challenging economic times for Pakistan, is actually significant. So that's two parts of the story. You know, there's the conditions and the economic potential. There's also the sort of well-known, well-worn story around how we are actually trying to increase and facilitate trade. But I think there's a third dimension to this story that I'd also briefly like to um, talk about. Because I think if we really want to champion economic prosperity, then we've also got to rethink government. And I promise you that if we rethink government in the right way, then we can actually unlock so much fiscal space. Right? We can unlock so much fiscal space that in a country where the private sector economy is relatively underrepresented, it is important that the government spend as much as possible right, pumping it into the economy rather than on unproductive spend. Right? And that is what will actually drive the economy. And there I can very proudly say that we lead what I would call in my previous job the market. We lead the market. I hope, I believe, I firmly believe that we lead the Federation. So just today, and I'll tell you four or five different examples. Just today in the cabinet, we approved, and I just tweeted about it, we approved the first ever really private sector type of performance incentive based program for our revenue authority. So the taxpayer money is not just simply going to people to turn up to work and go back, but it's going to deliver. Right? This is perhaps a first of its kind in terms of we took six months to think of how to make sure that the incentives that we give to them will drive the right behavior and drive the right growth obje objectives, right? And not create perverse incentives, and then actually give that entire organization a, 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 a performance incentive on that count, rather than just giving them an allowance. Now, this is massive because I think there's, there's a lot of accountants in the room. Just to do the basic maths for you, we spend about 220 billion rupees on salaries, out of which about 100 billion rupees is what is called basic pay, and 120 billion rupees is on what is called allowances. And while a large chunk of these allowances should actually foster and encourage service delivery, None of this 120 billion, and the ratios are the same across every other province and the federal government, none of this potential top-up, which is fair salary, is actually used to get people to do their job better, so to work as an incentive. That is a 120 billion or 60% of the potential salary bucket of the budget that is given away without necessarily getting anything additional in return. We are changing that before anyone else is changing that. Give you another example. When I started engaging with the department on how we take financial decisions, 
some of you will believe this because they will have been close enough to government. Some of you will not believe this because uh, you haven't been close enough to government. But uh, it took me some time to realize that the way that government has traditionally taken financial decisions is by basically someone in the finance department looking at what is called the account one or the account four balance in the morning and saying, we have so much money at the bank, and this is going to dictate how much I can spend today or not. Right? This is incredible. I think in 13th century Venice, they probably uh, managed uh, accounts. In fact, I know they managed them a lot better than traditional government accounting in Pakistan. And we need your help over here. Right? We're now trying to get more accountants, more chartered accountants, more CFAs on board to try and develop a more sophisticated view of how financial decisions, financial forecasting, and financial allocations are taken. Right? And over the last year, we've changed that in government. You know that this is the only province that has actually almost released its entire development budget for the year. We've released all money to all high spending departments, the ones that actually build infrastructure. We've re released all money to every high impact project. And we released in, within the second quarter all money for the second and the third quarter. And before the end of January, we will probably release whatever is left. You know why we can do that? Because we moved away from that daily accounting system view of how to run government to create a financial forecast as you were at your companies and look at the revenues in that forecast and look at our expenditure trends and look at what we needed to do to actually uh, take bold financial decisions and turn that into action within two months. And the impact of that over the province will be huge in the next six months because you won't have the typical government cycle where 35% of spending happens in June and goes down the toilet. Right? That, for me, is again a province that is starting to lead the way to economic prosperity by trying to not create the incremental rupee of fiscal space in government but by completely changing the game. Right? And I look at this and I do this. I'm not, I'm not an accountant. I'm not even a finance guy. I'm just someone with a lot of experience in general management who therefore, as a general manager, has had a deep look at how CEO level financial decisions should be taken as well. But I can tell you that each of these decisions is creating significant impact in how the province is being run by creating what is really the holy grail of government, which is how much money we have available to spend and how effectively are we spending it. We're also the first province that is going to completely integrate decision-making across the current and development budgets, which is another notion which is sort of alien to government decision making in Pakistan. Every department seems to have two budgets, one for salaries and one for building infrastructure. Whereas if you look at it, the health budget is the health budget. I can choose to build new hospitals with it. I can choose to get more doctors or I can choose to improve existing hospitals or, and I can choose to do a little bit of all three in different combinations. But I will only have one pot of money for him. And I need to think about it top down. And for the first time, and perhaps more so than any other province, that is the way we're thinking about the budget and how to allocate money. We're doing it for the government as a whole. And the impact of that will be this is the first year that every district in the province will have its most critical investments reflected in the budget because they will have a first port of call on spending before anything else. 
right? This is also the first time when every critical or strategic spin will similarly have a first port of call. It's also the first time that when we think of additional recruitment, you know, we, I often get um, criticized for a move that I champion and own, which is increasing the retirement age, because people don't understand, A, that this saves a poor province 25 billion a year, 18 to 25 billion a year, that it saves it in perpetuity because we change not just the retirement age and the early retirement age, and that the beneficiaries are the same people who are criticizing it because it allows me not just to invest more money in the economy and the private sector that creates a multiplier of jobs, but it actually paradoxically also allows me to create more jobs in government because rather than filling jobs that I'm simply filling because someone who's 60, so say there's something called the daftari who retires at 60, just because the post is empty, I now need to get a daftari whose job is simply to pick paper from one office and take it to another office. I can actually use that money to hire a teacher in a school and rather than have one teacher in a school I can have two or three or four teachers in a school and that will have a multiplier effect on how the poorest kids get educated, the quality of education that they get and we're able to do that because we're actually saving that 25 billion rupees a year people, the people who need that money the most Investing it in creating more jobs in the government, investing it in creating more jobs in the private sector, and investing it in more infrastructure that actually facilitates the lives of the poorest citizens. And again, I'm proud to say that KP is leading that. We're also trying to facilitate the private sector. And I can tell you that we're nowhere near as facilitative or as dynamic as I hope to be. But we have a vision to, to, to actually be the first province in Pakistan that is actually business friendly. And while we're not there, because to be there, we have to get enough of the right people on board in technical roles, and we're in the process of doing that, I can give you two examples of how we have done that. Last year, we slashed taxes on services in 29 out of 58 categories because for the first time we looked at the system holistically and we are going to build on that by slashing fees further. In fact, let me make an announcement tonight based on a meeting we had with the Prime Minister on Monday. We will eliminate a hundred different kinds of local government fees and taxes which bring very little revenue, but create a lot of potential for pain and rent seeking, they will be gone in less than 32 days. <laughs> Similarly, by the next budget, we're going to massively simplify our tax regime further, not because I want to collect less money, as is proven by the fact that KPRA, as a result of the reform, is growing 83% year on year. To give you a comparison, in Punjab, growth is 23%. Federal government's growth is 17%. We are growing four times more. And you know what's, what makes me proud on that? And I'm actually going to KPRA after this because I make them work hard. But what makes me proud is I don't get any complaints about their professionalism. I don't get any complaints about their behavior. And while we've given them an incentive scheme, we've kept it conditional on the fact that we will verify their service delivery through independent surveys, and the quality of their service delivery and customer satisfaction cannot go down. June cannot come and they cannot be crazy. But to go back to what we're saying over here, that I gave you one example right, of how we're actually in government dynamically increasing revenue, increasing service delivery, and we're doing this across the board. 
right? And the more of this kind of financial management that we do, I actually believe that we can find 50 to 100 billion rupees of fiscal space every year that by being injected in the economy can actually keep the province's economy afloat and by keeping the province's economy afloat can keep the country's economy afloat. The last thing that I'd say to this, and I'll spend my leave, what, what's critical to all this? What's critical to all this is that we actually get some of our best talent some of our brightest minds, people who've got exposure and seen the world in the positions that can make a difference. And you and some of you are some of the people in this room who can actually do that. And the reason that we've achieved some of what we have is actually because we've started that sort of journey. We've got people like Hassan Daoud who actually bring investment attraction experience and we've brought them here to now build a new investment organization so that they can actually make real that oft-used phrase of having a one-stop shop for investment. We're doing it in different departments, so we've got a reform unit in the finance department that's supporting me on all this budgetary reform, you know, uh, uh, and it, it consists of people that all come from the market, come from all over the country, including Pohtunkhwa, including Lahore, including Islamabad. None of them are people that will ever want a permanent job in government, but they actually want to have an impact on changing their country. And we managed to work in detail to put in place the right recruitment rules, the right compensation policies to get those people here and work and support many of the very good people in government to really make a difference. And the more of that kind of capacity we have, the faster our growth and improvement trajectory will be. And that's my aspiration. We'll never be satisfied with our rate of growth. But we want to be satisfied with our effort, and we want to make sure that that rate is always increasing. Um, and with an anecdote, we have a um, donor-driven program on improving budget management and improving financial reform, and they were meeting me the other day, and they gave me a list of 10 initiatives that they thought the program should be doing over the next three years. Uh, they talked about integrated budgeting, so I said, but we're already doing that. And they talked about more transparency and data, and I actually had, in fact, we will release the first ever transparent expenditure report on the actual expenditure in the next couple of weeks, which is something that has never been done in this country. So they said we need to build that. I said, here's a copy. I have it. I'm just looking at the numbers. So the numbers are right. They talked about uh, three-year, five-year budgeting. We said, again, we're doing that. So by the time we got to number 10, you know, they said we are also doing that. But I said we should give them something because they ought to have something to do. I said, yeah, yeah, you can work on this. Right. And I think what is important as you take away uh, from this speech is the fact that this is a young province. This is uh, maybe not the province that has the greatest ability. Maybe it's not the province with the biggest market. Uh, maybe it's not the first place that you traditionally think of in terms of investment. But remember that this is a young province. This is a hungry province for success. This is a province that has aspiration, and most importantly, this is perhaps the most open place in Pakistan to change. So if that's an environment that you want to operate in, and that's an environment that you want to encourage, then come and help us build a better and more dynamic Pukhtunkhwa, because it will not just be a gateway to Pakistan's prosperity in terms of 
building more uh, economic activity through greater trade and investment, it's actually going to be a gateway to Pakistan's prosperity by leading the journey to reform. Thank you very much.